Hey friend, good to see you again. Today I want to talk to you about the importance of reading fiction books. I think in today's society, and I know I'm guilty of this and have been, um, I focus a lot on nonfiction. I think it's the, the YouTube culture, the, the hacking culture, the um, I want a shortcut. I just want to be told A, B, C, do one, two, three. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about this because I've been working on my on my guide to help people quit alcohol, you know, at 50 basically. And and uh, trying to pare it down to like, just do these three things. Just do these four things. Also, that paired with the fact that my father-in-law and I have been getting closer uh, over the years uh, as he's aging up, as I'm aging up. I've been, I've been married 16 years to his daughter. Uh, and I would say in the last three to four years, we've been closer than we ever have. And some of that has been bonding through reading fiction books, sharing books with one another. Matter of fact, James Mishner is a very famous, I'm going to show, put a, put a, put a picture of the book up, very famous author, uh, historical fiction, feel the surprise winner. Um, you should read some of his books. I had never read one of James Mishner's books until about a year and a half ago. And uh, if you are somewhat familiar with him, you, you might remember he writes very thick historical books. But he also, my father-in-law was very smart to give me a smaller, some of his smaller books when he first was getting started, easier to read and to, to digest. But the point of all of that, the point of all of that is, is that we're in this nonfiction, give me a quick click, tell me something, let me listen to a podcast, uh, I need some information. I, I'm here to tell you that the secret to pro productivity and a happy life uh, is through the storytelling. And Mishner, in this book, Fire of the Spring, that was written, I think it was his second book, so it was written in the 50s. Uh, it was first published in 1949, okay? Uh, it's, a it's a story uh, about a young boy, uh, 12 or 13 years old, uh, that starts out in the in a in a poorhouse with what the what they call it in the book, right? A place right outside of town where the people that are destitute without money uh, live. And what I'm trying to tell you, or trying to communicate with you, is that think about this. Think about all the information that you receive through podcasts, and oh, I should do this. I should do that. I should use that app. I should bullet journal. I should. I should write my top 10 list, what, whatever it is, and you don't do it. There are so many things that we, we know, they sound right to our mind, but we don't internalize them, we, we, don't, we don't change, right? And I think we do change when a story impacts us. And I think that that can only be done through a narrative. And that's why I think so many, if not all, of our religious texts no matter which faith you're from, are told in a narrative form. That's why mythology is told in a narrative form. And I think uh, us in, in our, our modern times, or I guess technically postmodern times now, uh, 21st century, uh, we don't think of it in those terms. We don't, but that's how we learn. So what I want to teach you today, and in this glory, is how about, how about this? If you've gone this far with me. I'm on my seminary uh, campus. There, the, back in the 90s, uh, I actually went to the school. I graduated from the school. Uh, it's here in Austin, Texas. It's, it's a very beautiful campus. I'm going to show you a little B-roll. Um, and the, you've got the, the, the uh, chapel behind me and uh, my, my Stitt Library, which I've showed you a little picture of as well. That's where I used to work as my student job. But I, I studied here uh, and got my Master's of Divinity uh, from 1991 through about 96, don't quote me on that, Some, somewhere in, the, in those years, it's kind of blurry, but, uh, and I come back, and yes, they changed the buildings a little bit, but these trees and these buildings stand the test of time, and, and they're, they're just, a, a, just a, a center of learning, if you will, and uh, I find solace when I come here. So, I was reading some of this book last night, and there's a section, so David, David uh, has, he's being raised by several of the older men, and, and, and it's like in a dormitory setup. And one of the older men, uh, his favorite, the one who takes a liking to David, develops cancer. And 
we all know where cancer goes. It, it leads ultimately to our demise, to our death. And they take him out of his room and they bring him, they bring him uh, the man who's dying, to the infirmary. And, and David fights with the nurse but is able to sit with, with, uh, with Daniel because uh, Daniel's, Daniel wants him there in his final time. Um, it's part of the rites of passage of learning to be a young man. And David said, and, and excuse me, Daniel, the, the gentleman who's dying says, David, listen. And that was the beginning of a long, long talk that they engaged in while he lied there dying. Uh, so he's imparting. The part I want to share with you is, in a final surge of desire to protect his spirit, excuse me, in the in a final surge of desire to project his spirit into some kind of life after the body's death, the old man spent his accumulated philosophy upon the boy. And I thought about that intently. And I thought about our lives that we have here that, that we know are finite, that are coming to a close. Especially if, if, you're, if you're over 50, uh, maybe I, I spent a little bit more time reflecting on on the time I have left and the power of contribution the power of sharing your story forward uh, and doing something for good I think I think that is the uh, if there is an afterlife I think there's something to be said for that of allowing our our, our ourselves to 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 get to that higher plane by by passing forward and giving pain forward our knowledge our, our philosophy of life our wisdom if you will and and we do that through through stories through our presence i mean just imagine sitting there with someone who has cancer and maybe you've experienced this in your life uh you know maybe you have maybe you have and uh it, it can be impactful uh I know that when I had my appendixes out, my appendix, excuse me, singular, uh, many years ago, now five, six, seven years ago, it was later in life, and it was a quick, easy surgery, but I didn't know what was going on, and I was sitting in the hospital room and thinking, you know, I don't want to die, right? And who, who does? But mainly I was thinking that because I wasn't, I'm not, I'm not ready yet. I have more stuff to do. And, and ever since that day, I've had a stronger sense of motivation to do things so I make little videos like this that very few people watch but I really frankly don't care because uh, how many people I hope more people watch them just because I, I, I think there's value here but I know from the people I get to talk to because of these videos that that I'm connecting with someone and that's what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to do on a secondary level is to encourage you to find that 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 sense of braveness, that sense of courage, and that sense of uh, of discipline to 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 make make a um, you know just forge ahead to to make make room so that you can you can you can give to others. And while I'm going to close on that on that wonderful message, I think is that that's one of the things why I have a heart for people that struggle with alcohol. Or they struggle with food addiction. It's one of the reasons why I'm trying to lose weight. It's not so much that it's a vanity, like, oh, I've got to be thin. Uh, it's just that that our health uh, is paramount. That is what we have. And and our health provides us the opportunity to, to, to do more, if you will. And to, to stay around a little longer and, and to have a stronger voice. And, and addictions whether it's through overeating or, or, you know, that's, that's a complicated one or alcohol, or if it's cigarettes, we know these things are not serving us. And yet we, we feel like we're in a trap and, and I want to help to provide a path forward for people as much as I can. And so, and, and on the other side of that is not just freedom from alcohol or freedom from what other addiction you might have, whether that's staring at social media and, and the rest, but it, it frees you up to have time to start giving back and be a positive force in the world. And that's ultimately what I'm trying to do. And when I reflect back here while I'm at seminary where, where I studied 
uh, to be a Presbyterian minister is what I studied to be, that I actually never really was. Um, I was trying as a young man to make a difference in the world, and I did it through the channel that I grew up in. Uh, but now I see a broader sense of, of, of this full circle of where I've come and who I am, and this is the path that I have to give. So I know a little bit of rambling there, I hope you understood what I'm trying to communicate to you, and uh, and I just I just want to wish you the love and kindness, and and I hope that you accept it so that you can give that kindness to yourself. My name's Terry, uh, and I want to say thank you for watching.